Clinical Orthopedic Examination of Cervical Region In this video, we will discuss about Cervical Inspection, Palpation, Movement Assessment, Special Tests and Cervical Radiographs. Let's start the video. Cervical examination starts with the inspection. Note any asymmetry in supraclavicular fossa, it may be suggestive of Pankow's tumor. Note the presence of torticollis, where the head is pulled to the affected side and chin is often tilted to the opposite side. In congenital torticollis, there may be a small tumor in the stenomastoid muscle and facial asymmetry may also present in some untreated cases. In about one third cases of torticollis, abnormal head posture is due to ocular muscle weakness. In acquired torticollis, Protective muscle spasm may occur due to tonsillar or vertebral body infection. Acquired torticollis may sometimes seen accompanying the clipal fail syndrome. Protective muscle spasm may also be due to vertebral malalignment, trauma or upper respiratory infection. Next step of cervical examination is palpation. Pulpit the cervical region by looking for tenderness in the midline. Pulpit distally from occiput. Tenderness localized to one space is common in cervical spondylosis and rarely may because of cervical spine infection. Next, pulpit the lateral aspect of cervical vertebrae and look for any tenderness or masses. The most prominent spinous process is of T1 vertebrae. Pulpit into the supraclavicular fossa and check for the prominence of cervical rib along with local tenderness. Also look for tumor, masses and enlarged cervical lymph nodes. Thoroughly pulpit the anterior neck region including the thyroid gland. Next step is movement assessment. Check cervical flexion by asking the patient to bend his head forward. Note any asymmetry in motion or movement restriction. Check cervical extension by asking the patient to tilt the head backward. The plane of the nose and forehead should nearly be horizontal. Accurate assessment of cervical flexion can be made by using a spatula in the clenched teeth as a pointer. Line up the arms of goniometer with the spatula and the horizontal line. Normal angle is about 80 degrees. In the same way, cervical extension can be measured. Normal angle is about 50 degrees. To check the lateral flexion, ask the patient to tilt his head to one side. In normal cases, you can easily touch the shoulder with slight shrugging of shoulder. Repeat on the other side and note any difference in movement. For greater accuracy, a spatula 
clenched in teeth, can be used as a pointer. Normal range is about 45 degrees. Lateral flexion is commonly lost in cervical spondylosis. Any restriction in movement of side bending or flexion is indicative of pathology in the atlant occipital and atlant axial joint. To check the rotation, ask the patient to look over the shoulder. Rotation can also be measured by using a spatula as a pointer. Normal range is about 80 degrees. Rotation is usually restricted and painful in cervical spondylosis. Now, look for crepitus sound. Spread the hands on each side of the neck and ask the patient to flex and extend the spine. Facet joint crepitus is usually detectable in this fashion and is a common finding in cervical spondylosis. Thoracic outlet syndrome. It may result from involvement of space between scalenus anterior, scalenus medius and the first rib. So that the subclavian artery or anterior primary rami of lower cervical or first thoracic nerves may be affected. Begin by looking for evidence of ischemia in one hand. Check for coldness, discoloration and trophic changes. If symptoms are present bilaterally, it is more suggestive of Raynaud's disease. For the assessment of thoracic outlet syndrome, pulpit the radial pulse and apply traction to the arm. Note, any change in pulse. Repeat the test on the other side. Any obliteration in radial pulse is suggestive of thoracic outlet syndrome. Special test for thoracic outlet syndrome. Adsense test. Abduct the shoulder to about 30 degrees and pulpit the radial pulse. At this point, you can feel the radial pulse. Now, ask the patient to turn his head fully to the affected side. Then ask the patient to take the deep breath and hold. Then, lower the patient arm to the side and ask him to exhale and look forward. Now, again feel the radial pulse. Compare the pulse obtained in first position with the second one. Any change or reduction in pulse is suggestive of thoracic outlet syndrome. Also look for appearance of other symptoms like skin temperature or color changes. Repeat the test on both sides. Bruise test. Ask the patient to abduct and externally rotate the shoulders and flex elbows to the right angle. Then, ask the patient to clench his hand, make fist repeatedly and slowly, again and again, for up to three minutes. Appearance of neurological or vascular symptoms and early disappearance of radial pulse on affected side is suggestive of thoracic outlet syndrome. For further assessment of thoracic outlet syndrome, look for neurological disturbance. Check dermatomes and myotomes. Note any hypothenar or less commonly thinner wasting. Note any disturbance of sweating pattern in hand. Auscultate the subclavian artery. A murmur is suggestive of mechanical obstruction. 
Check both sides. Examine the radiographs for the presence of cervical rib. Cord compression and cervical myelopathy. Cord compression occurs due to developmental narrowing of spinal canal or after old ununited fractures of the dens or spinal subluxations. It may occur in cervical spondylosis due to osteophytes protruding posteriorly from the vertebral bodies or from the incovertebral joints or due to cervical disc prolapses. Main findings of cervical myelopathy. Muscle weakness which is greater in upper limbs as compared to the lower limbs. In the arms, lower motor signs predominates at the level of compression. In legs, there are exaggerated lower limb reflexes, clonus, extensor plantar response, loss of proprioception, and broad base or ataxic gait may present. Differential diagnosis includes multiple sclerosis. But in multiple sclerosis, there are usually abnormal cranial nerve findings present. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. But in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, there is no alteration in sensation. Subacute combined degeneration. In subacute combined degeneration, the difference between findings in upper and lower limbs is less striking. Special test for cervical myelopathy. Hoffman's test. Rapidly extend the distal phalanx of middle finger by flicking its anterior surface. The test is considered positive. If it results in flexion of interphalangeal joints of thumb and index finger. Dynamic Hoffman's test. Repeat the test while the patient flex and extend the neck. It often facilitates the response. L. Hermit's test. Ask the patient to flex and extend the neck. It produces Electric shock like sensations, particularly in legs. Inverted radial reflex. The test is considered positive if the fingers of the patient flex when radial reflex is elicited with reflex hammer. In cervical myelopathy, clonus can be seen. Myelopathy hand. This has two components. First one is kinetic. There is inability to rapidly flex and extend the fingers. Normal person can flex and extend the fingers more than 20 times in 10 seconds. The second component is postural. There is deficient abduction and often extension of last three fingers. The power of abduction is normal, distinguishing it from ulnar nerve palsy. Cervical radiographs This X-ray shows normal anteroposterior view of lower cervical vertebrae. This X-ray shows normal anteroposterior view of C1 to C3 vertebrae through the mouth. In anteroposterior view, note the shapes of vertebral bodies. Point A shows lateral wedging of vertebral body. May be due to any fracture, tumor or infection. Point B shows the presence of cervical rib. In this radiograph, lateral view of upper and lower cervical vertebrae shows normal lateral projections. Small non-significant opacity 
lying anterior to the body of C5, and well-defined pharyngeal shadow. While examining the cervical X-ray, note the cervical curves. Point A shows normal regular curve. Point B shows loss of curvature, may be due to positional error, but in patients of chronic neck pain, due to postural issue, it may be due to protective muscle spasm. Point C shows kinking may be due to local lesion such as subluxation or may be due to intense local muscle spasm. In cervical x-ray, note the general shapes of the vertebral bodies. Point A shows congenital vertebral fusion such as occurs in clipal fail syndrome. Point B shows vertebral collapse may be due to tuberculosis tumor or fracture look at the spaces and related margins of vertebras point a shows disc space narrowing point b shows anterior lipping and point c shows posterior lipping these all are the features of cervical spondylosis. Note any evidence of vertebral fusion. It is typically seen in ankylosing spondylitis, which is also called as bamboo spine. In this radiograph, point A shows the presence of an osteophyte or marginal fracture. It is suggestive of an extension injury of neck. Point B shows fracture of a spinous process. It is suggestive of a flexion injury of cervical spine. At point C and D, note that the diameter of C5 should not exceed the vertebral body diameter by more than 6 mm. This is the normal oblique projection of the cervical spine. In this radiograph, note the Pavlov ratio. It is the ratio between the cervical canal and related vertebral body. Normally, the depth of the cervical canal is greater as that of its related vertebral body giving a Pavlov ratio of 1.0. A Pavlov ratio of 0.8 or less indicates a developmentally narrow cervical canal with risk of cord compression. In this X-ray the cervical curvature is reversed, there is the wedging of body of C6 vertebrae. Diagnosis is fracture of C6 vertebrae. This x ray shows the congenital fusion of the cervical spine. C3, C4, and C5 are represented by a solid bony mass. Diagnosis is congenital fusion of cervical spine. In this radiograph, there is widespread fusion of intervertebral facet joints and the anterior longitudinal ligament is calcified. Diagnosis is ankylosing spondylitis. In this x-ray, there is slight forward shift of the body of C6 vertebrae relative to that of C7. Diagnosis is unilateral facet dislocation of C6 on C7. This X-ray shows that there is marked loss of vertebral alignment and the inferior articular process of C6 are lying in front of the superior articular process of C7. The spinous process of C5 and C6 are fractured. Diagnosis is dislocation of C6 on C7 with locked facets. 
In this X-ray, there is narrowing of the C5 C6 disk space to a lesser extent that of C6 C7. There is anterior lipping of C4, 5, 6 and C7. Diagnosis is cervical spondylosis. In this X-ray, there is loss of normal cervical curvature, narrowing of C5 C6 disc space, and anterior lipping. There is an avulsion fracture of the anterior inferior margin of C4. Diagnosis is extension injury with marginal fracture. This radiograph is taken in flexion. It shows excessive gap between the anterior arch of atlas and the odontoid process. There is generalized vertebral demineralization. Diagnosis is rheumatoid arthritis with atlantaxial subluxation. This radiograph shows that the transverse process of C7 vertebrae is enlarged on both sides. Diagnosis is congenital deformity of cervical spine. This radiograph shows an extra rib on one side. Diagnosis is cervical rib. If you want to watch more such videos in future, hit the subscribe button and press the bell icon.